Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where Dr. Janine Krause, that's me, gives you, a health junkie, a weekly dose of tools to help you increase your energy and resilience to life stressors. Hello there, health junkies. Welcome to another episode of the Health Fix. I'm your host, Dr. Janine Krause, and on today's episode, I'm interviewing Dr. Erin Kalik. She is a medical doctor, and she works in my office, and we've been talking about what it's like to be in private practice, but also what it's like to be able to offer more time to our patients more value. And in her case, she has just started a private practice that is a membership-based practice, and it's all about primary care. So we're going to talk about what that looks like and why you might want to jump out of the insurance circle and jump over to a membership-based practice, or why you might want to jump into a program-based practice or a functional medicine-based practice. So it's no secret that the conventional medical model is broken. Just look around you. There's a lot of folks that are really struggling and you might even be listening to this right now and you've got a certain health condition that you're trying to sleuth out and figure out what's going on. Unfortunately, with our 15 minute time constraints and battling with insurance companies to actually get them to pay for any more time than that, it's not sustainable for the conventional doc on their own to really do a lot of functional medicine. And so we don't get results that we want. And this is why I've started to change my practice slowly over time because I was frustrated with not seeing people for months at a time and quick visits and not giving enough time. Now, a lot of folks who see me in practice might be like, well, doc, you give like 35, 45 minutes. Yes, in most cases I do. And it's been at a sacrifice to be able to get some time in so I get to know my people. But unfortunately, financially, it's it's a little rough to, to do that. I don't need a pity party though. I'm only mentioning that just because I want you all to understand then it's not the conventional medicine doctor's faults out there. It's not that they don't want to listen. It's not that they don't care. It's really truly that they are under constraints based on whoever their employer may be. And so you'll hear a little bit about that from, from Dr. Aaron as we move through the podcast. Now, at this point, why would you want to see a functional medicine doc? Why would you want to go to a private practice that is a membership-based practice when you pay for insurance? because insurance is expensive. Well, here's the thing, having extra backup, someone who's going to help you to sleuth out issues actually saves you time and money in the long run because your healthcare is much like a, it should be much like a relationship with your practitioner. You should be working back and forth as a team to help you sleuth things out because let's face it, a lot of us have blind spots when it comes to our health. I have to have a team member to help me. I have functional medicine docs that help me to get over some of the health conditions that I have. You need someone that can bounce ideas off you versus a family member. You need someone outside of your inner circle to help you to navigate you through. And so what kind of problem do functional medicine docs and private practice memberships solve? They give you the time with the doc to be able to form a relationship so that you get to know each other and you can predict and identify things that are going to be issues in the long run and right now. You have time essentially to sleuth out your issues because really when it boils down to it, someone who knows you and is working in a relationship as a team with you for your healthcare and guiding you versus authoritating, <laughs> it's not a word, but being authoritative with you, it, it doesn't work. We know that this conventional medicine model doesn't work. And so if you are struggling with a medical condition and you're not getting results, you want to consider finding someone who's a good fit with you. You drive, you get along, and you know that you can work together to help move you forward. It's worth it to spend a couple extra dollars for that type of relationship, but also for the specialty labs so that you can look into things and explore things further. So really what life looks like when you are working with a functional medicine doc or a doc that's in private practice that can spend more time with you is that you're gonna get better care. You're gonna get better results. Someone is going to be more accountable for you because they're gonna be looking and checking and seeing what's going on. How are things going? Checking in is probably the biggest factor that I see as what is lacking in terms of someone sticking with a protocol. 
Think about this. How many times have you went into the doc and you completely forgot what they said to do or all of the recommendations? A lot of times in a naturopathic doctor's office, we give 5,000 things for you to do because we're so excited and we want you to have all of the stuff because we might not see you for a couple months. And that what does that do? That overloads the brain. So thinking about having someone who can dole out the information one step at a time to really give you what you need. Now, how can you get a hold of someone like me in your area? You can go to whatever browser you use and put in functional medicine doctor that specializes in whatever you need help with. Or you could put in naturopathic doctor as well. Or you could look for a private primary care practice just like Dr. Aaron. So I've been talking all about myself, but I definitely want you to get a little insight into someone else's practice and why you might want to choose a membership-based primary care practice in addition to something like a functional medicine practice. So let's meet Dr. Aaron. Aaron, thanks for coming on The Health Fix. Thank you so much for having me. So of course, you know, a lot of people are looking at alternative ways to, to get their healthcare because, well, unfortunately, we are a sicker nation uh, day by day, unfortunately. And the average doctor's visit doesn't usually get us what we want. And a lot of people come into my office complaining like, doc, I was told that I could only discuss one problem and I barely had five minutes with the doc. Now, of course, you come from the conventional medical model. Is, is that what you found too in, in your practice in the conventional world? You, you could only discuss one problem and 15 minutes was all you were allotted per patient. Uh, that was definitely the, the goal purported by management, mm -hmm. you know, right there. It was couched in, in talk about helping us become more efficient, you know, maintain our empathy and, and help patients, you know, listen well. We had uh, in in the healthcare system that I worked in, we had physician coaches that would come around and and monitor, sit in a visit with us, and and help observe and then comment about how we could uh, communicate better with patients. Mm -hmm. And so there was, there's even in the conventional model, there's definitely a desire to give better care and listen listen well, but at the same time, you're monitored uh, uh, in terms of, and, and compensated in terms of how many patients you can see in a day and whether or not you can get all the administrative tasks associated with those visits completed in a, in a certain amount of time for medical legal reasons and all that. So there was, there was you know, seemed a lot of talking out of both sides of, of the mouth, right, from the management. That on the one hand, yes, we want you to, to be there for your patients and, and do what, what needs to be done and do it well and, and in a caring way. And also, we want you to see this many patients. And if you get behind on your charting, then we aren't going to pay you what we promised. We're going to pay you some lesser amount. So there was, there was always that tension. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that I'm putting you on the spot a little bit like that. And, and really it's not meant to, to be, you know, any, anything to the conventional med medical model. I mean, honestly, it, it, they're all businesses. And as a business owner myself, I started to see why it was a time crunch because we are paid via insurance on time. And, and that is the reality of things. And unfortunately, when you also have to squeeze into that time, your administrative duties, just like we had talked about before, I often spent two to three hours after a regular day doing all of the admin. And so at the end of the day, sadly, the patients pay the price because we cut into that because of course we want to get paid too. So that leads me into moving forward <laughs> and how we can kind of get folks a little bit better care. But before we move into talking about your, your private practice that you have now, I'd love to hear about your stories to how you became a doctor. Did you want to be a doctor since you were a kiddo? How, how did it play out for you? Uh, so I actually grew up uh, in a small town in Washington state, you know, no stoplight, dairy cows, that whole thing. Uh, and, and we had family docs. We did not have any specialist to my knowledge. And my family was healthy enough that we never had to seek care outside of our little town. So I really only kind of knew about family medicine. And I would walk down to the family medicine office after school if I needed 
X, Y, Z, right? And I could talk with those docs and know that they weren't necessarily going to tell my parents. And that was this, I had a relationship with them. I was in school with their kids, you know, so that was the kind of medicine that I had in my mind when I went to medical school. And it wasn't until medical school, really, that I realized, oh, wow, there's a lot of, there's a lot of different fields, you know? Uh, And so for a while, I entertained the idea of being a pediatrician in part because in high school, what really prompted the, the thought about medical school was the woman I nannied for just looked at me one day and said, you'd make an excellent pediatrician. (laughs) And I remember thinking, "Mm, people like me don't become doctors, right? And I guess in my mind, that meant my parents were blue collar, going to college was going to be a big thing, that not all my, none of my (laughs) family had done other than one uncle. So that seemed so far out there, but I think it planted the seed. And then when I went to college, uh, my mom said, of the, of the three kids, I have two siblings, me going into science and math was a huge shock because everybody thought I was going to be an English or history major and, and be a teacher and have six kids. Uh, <laughs> but instead, I'm a, a family doc uh, and had kids late in life, and I have three. Nice. Nice. How old are your kiddos? Uh, they are nine, eight, and six. Wow. Wow. So it's a good range though. It gives a little bit of break in between. I mean, nine and eight's a little, but then the six that I think it's a good, it's a good range. You're you're still pre-hormones yet. (laughs) Yeah. I'm going to have to learn more about hormones in in that realm. Yeah. Well, you know, one one day at a time, right? One day at a time. Now, I, I love the fact that you talked about the, like the family doc where you could just go and hang out. That's kind of what I had when in my head, when I started coming up with the idea of how I wanted my practice to look, I knew there were specialists. I grew up in a little bit more of a suburban area outside of Chicago, but I, I just loved having that connection with my, my practitioners. And my, my story is more that I, I, I hijacked my mom's car while she was going for chemo treatments and she was going for acupuncture. And I was like, I'm your driver. I will get my driver's license and thought, you know, all I was going to do is get my driver's license. But really I ended up realizing how cool acupuncture was and how that doc just kind of invited you into his practice. And so I love the idea of having kind of that door open where, you know, you have questions, you have things of that nature and, and you can just bring them into the office, much like old school medicine, was and I wish it, you know, we can revive it. And that's, I think what you're doing. So you have a practice that's a membership practice, which means folks have more access to you. Mm -hmm. Will you tell us a little bit about how that looks? Because I think this kind of brings to light that old school family medicine doc with the new twist. Right. That's the hope. Um, Direct primary care was actually started a couple decades ago by people who trained me actually uh, in Seattle based on that desire to have a a focus again on the doctor patient relationship, a direct relationship between the doctor and the patient without the middleman, uh, without management and bureaucracy and all of that, which stems from insurance. The idea was that insurance was really hurting more than it was helping. And, And there's a place for insurance, of course, and there's a place for the tertiary medical center, but knowing that 80 plus percent of what patients need can be achieved well in the primary care office if given sufficient you know time energy and access uh they really wanted so dr erica and garrison bliss wanted to bring that back so they boldly did that uh, and i'm benefiting uh and the idea for me is that well, to back up a little bit, I had a couple of patients uh, that left my corporate medicine practice that I knew I had a good relationship with. So I called both of them and just asked what, what happened, you know, and both of them, one of, one of them, it was a similar story, but the, but the one gal, she said, I know you're part-time. I was willing to wait for you, but I got in a car accident, my neck hurt, and I wanted to know that I was okay. And I wanted to be treated. And your office told me that they, you couldn't see me for two months. And they told me that they talked with you about it and that you couldn't squeeze me in. And I was floored because of course I, I, you know, and so I went back and looked at my in basket to see, did I miss something? You know, did I miss a message? Uh, Because I absolutely would squeeze someone in. Uh, And 
that, and, and I hadn't missed anything. It was just that, you know, someone new at the front office, you know, felt probably a little bit backed into a corner or something. And so the other system in town was able to get that woman in as a brand new patient the very next day. So of course she felt like, well, in my time of need, my doctor isn't here for me. And that just really felt horrible. And I had several nurses as patients who had, you know, and people who'd been pregnant who had my cell phone and they would text me and say, your office tells me you can't see me for X length of time. Is that true? Mm -hmm. I really only need something super quick. Actually, I just need you to refill this thing or, you know, and so just getting through the layers was just so challenging. And I knew that if these people who had access to my cell phone were needing to text me these things that countless others were also having that issue. And part of it's that when you're in corporate medicine, the, the, uh, the management decides how many patients a physician will quote unquote carry on their panel. And the average full-time corporate doc has 15 to 2,500 patients on their panel. And as you can well imagine, when you see a patient in the office, you ask them to follow up. You're right. And so it was just the subset of patients really that were on your schedule that would get booked into future appointments. And then anyone who hadn't been seen in a while really couldn't squeeze back in. Right. And so I was, I probably only recognized several hundred of the names. And as a direct primary care doc, I get to say, I can give good care in a timely fashion to 300 people, not 1300 people. And so I'm going to cap my practice at that level and, and be able to have patients text me, email me, call me virtual visit, whatever works for them. And if an in-office visit is needed, I want it to be a comfortable, welcoming, calm place. (laughs) I don't want it to be a scary, sterile (laughs) part of an urgent care (laughs) in the middle of COVID. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think there's, there's a lot to be said about, you know, getting into office that's quiet, not so many people. So we're not overwhelmed by so many people in our space. And, you know, now that we're all more aware of our our space at this point and, and things of that nature, but no, I I mean, I think it's really, really what you're hitting on with the, the connection with people, because Mm -hmm. for me, when I look at who's coming today, you know, for a visit in terms of whether I'm seeing them virtual or whether I'm seeing them in person, I, I like knowing the names and I like being able to see when they come in and ask about the dog or the kids or, you know, whatever I, you know, remember from our last chat and having a relationship. I think it, you can catch those little things yes. that you might not catch if you see someone once a year. Exactly. I mean, I, I cared for this one woman who established care with me when she was at her wits end, a young woman overwhelmed in her job and depressed. And we talked through several visits. She then was following up a little less frequently. And within a year, she came in my office and she looked like an entirely different person. She had quit her corporate job, gone out on her own, you know, was doing all these things. And then fast forward one more year, she came in and she didn't look quite as, as dramatically depressed as the first visit, but she didn't look as good as, as the year prior. And so I was able to see that and say, okay, what's going on? Yeah. You're not, you're not as vibrant as you were last year. Like, let's talk through this, you know? And, and we did, and it just, that kind of thing having, because if she had shown up that third time, well, it's not really the third time, but you know, in the, for the story, <laughs> the third time, in my office or, you know, having to see the ARNP or um, that I worked with who I loved, I'm not, this is not a slam on nurse practitioners. I love that woman. But if she had to see someone that was not me, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have noticed because she looked healthy and fine. Uh, And so that, and they wouldn't have probed and they wouldn't have asked those questions. And she would have just had the, the small issue that she came in for be the thing that was addressed and the bigger thing would have gone unnoticed. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's true. It's true. I I think there's a lot to be said about that. And, and for me, I mean, that's when I started to get busier and busier in my practice, I started to get anxious because I couldn't hold all the details about people in my head. And, Mm -hmm. and that starts to get a little bit frustrating. And plus when you have so much admin and 
and different things going on. I think that's what kind of led to me having more or less my, my like crisis where I was like, I can't do this level anymore because I'm not connecting because I'm such a people connector. And if I can't connect with people and I'm missing things kills me. Yes. Yes. And, and I think if you, I mean, when you know that you are squeezing patients in, whenever you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else. Right. So I, I did care and want to, I do care. And, and when people need to see me, I do want to say yes. Uh, and that would invariably mean that I was disappointing someone else, right? Either I'm disappointing the staff who's supporting me and now they're late to lunch or they're late getting out of work or they're anxious because they're not going to make it to the daycare on time or it was their night to make dinner and they're not going to be able to, or I'm disappointing the patients who are waiting in the waiting room because their appointment was at 10, but the 930 patient had, you know, a lot going on and I'm me and I listen. So, or I'm disappointing my family because I'm not home on time. Or by the time I get home, I know that I still have three hours worth of work to do. So I'm sort of half present um, at the dinner table and rushing bedtime so that I can get back upstairs and, you know, do the rest of the stuff. So that kind of model where you just, you have a ton of patients on your panel and you, you're literally squeezing people in back to back to back to back all day and not taking time to, you know, <laughs> go to the bathroom or eat or chart, <laughs> then you just push all that stuff to later in the night. So I wanted the direct primary care model, you know, having been going now for 20 plus years, the, the studies that they've, that people have done within the DPC um, model, the patients enjoy it more, the physicians have higher satisfaction and health outcomes are actually better. I think for reasons I was talking about earlier that when you have a relationship with someone, you can see the subtle changes. Yeah. And you can breathe to think when you need to be present to think in a visit and go, okay, what is really going on here? You know, connecting dots. I, I think there, there's, I mean, that's worth its weight in gold. And mm -hmm. that's why I do love the, the direct patient care model. Now, I think a lot of people might be listening right now and going, okay, so what all things can you do in, in your office? You know, because I think for a lot of people, and, and that was one of the questions that was brought to me in, you know, when I sent out the message and said, hey, I have Aaron in my office. A lot of people are like, okay, what can she do? <laughs> So will you kind of give us a little rundown of, of what you can do and all the different services you can offer in the office? Uh, yes and no. Um, <laughs> so family medicine uh, is, a, is a specialty that, uh, so I do medical school and then, or I did medical school and then a three-year residency where family med docs learn to do uh, what we call cradle to grave medicine, but it's really like obstetrics and cradle to grave. So, uh, and then I did an extra year of training in rheumatologic and women's health and OB, but in the direct primary care model, I'm not doing obstetrics, but I can see, um, I, I will have home visits for uh, newborns because I, I know as a, as a postpartum person, going to the office to bring in your small little bundle for a weight check and make sure they're feeding okay and thriving is scary and cumbersome. And in the time of COVID, I'm sure that much scarier. Uh, so I'm, I'm planning to do that as well. But so I do all the things for newborn through um, elderly care with the caveat that Medicare in a direct primary care practice, I, I've opted out of Medicare. Uh, so patients would have me, patients who use Medicare would have me as a um, kind of an extra, you know, if similar to if they had an acupuncturist or a massage therapist, or they need to pay cash for that and not ask Medicare to reimburse them for that. But um, in terms of actual services, I do all the things for women's health. So, um, you know, pap smears, pelvic exams, uh, STD testing, um, what else? Um, breast, you know, breast, breast, breast exams, although, you know, they're, those are the evidence is suggesting we go away from it, but yes, I'm trained. I know how to do them. If there's something to evaluate, I would evaluate it. Um, all the simple procedures, you know, like laceration repair, biopsies, uh, 
you know, cryotherapy things, you know, you have skin issues of various sorts. I, I know how to remove toenails when they need to be removed, which grosses a lot of people out, but it's actually a very simple, straightforward procedure. Um, I do, I do joint injections and trigger point injections. Uh, I'm learning aesthetics. So that's a, to be, to be determined, uh, coming down the pike kind of thing. What else would be depressed? I, I do mental health stuff. Um, primary care really runs the, the gamut. Yeah. I think, you know, sometimes people are thinking like, Hey, Dr. Aaron, I have a, a UTI. Can I come in and will you dip my urine or, Hey, yeah. I just sprained my ankle. Can you look to tell me if I need an x-ray like that kind of yeah. stuff? Yes. And- yeah. And, and actually my patients, from before who have, I guess, been looking on Google to see if I'll pop back up. Um, several of them have messaged me and they say, well, can you still do this? Can you still do? And I keep saying, yeah, I'm the same person with all the same training. Uh, it's just going to be a little bit of a cobblestone road instead of the Autobahn in terms of, of setting up all the different things that when I was in a corporate structure, I walked into the office and I just got to practice medicine and I, and I got to rely on the office manager to have all the supplies I needed for a biopsy or all the supplies I needed for, you know, ultrasound or, you know, all this stuff. So I'm acquiring those things as I need them, uh, based on patient demand. Perfect. Perfect. No, I think, you know, we, we have the opportunity today to kind of just share everything. Cause I think a lot of people are like, I don't, rem-, you know, medicine is now very confusing to all of us, even us in the field when it comes to insurance. And so a lot of people are like, so if I go to you, can I use my insurance to pay for the labs? And so right. folks are looking at that kind of stuff. I know a lot of people, obviously with the direct patient care model guys, this is cash-based practice, but when you pay cash, the value is in that because you get time. And she doesn't have, like you already heard, she does not have 1,500, 2,500 people in her caseload. And and so now she gets to know you, she develops a relationship with you. It's much like having your partner or guide in your healthcare here. And that that's how I see uh, direct care. You're not getting just someone who's going to crank out the, you know, motions, like you actually are going to follow up and care. Now, another one that I was asked, which kind of follows up in the biopsy, and I'm just going to say it because I know that someone's going to ask me about it, lipomas. <laughs> Can you remove lipomas? Yes and no. Okay. Uh, you are. don't have to remove them. If they're painful in the way, you know, they can be removed depending on location and size, it can be safe and easy peasy in the office, but it also can be something that would best be done in a, in an office, uh, like a general surgeon's office. So it really, it really depends size, location, all that. And I think that would matter too, in terms of biopsies too, what you're getting into in that department. And yes. when we were talking cryo. I have a lot of people that ask a lot about planters warts and finger warts and all yes. of that stuff. Right. And so cryotherapy would be mm-hmm. or, or potophyllin, like the, the topical types of things would be right. Would be. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Mm-hmm. So you've got quite, I mean, it's, it's a, a broad spectrum of things that you can do. And so, you know, looking at this model, I think it's a great way to be able to provide care. Now, in terms of your, ideal patient. I love to always ask this. So if you have someone that, you know, just comes in and you're going to work well with them, what, what's your ideal patient? I've thought a lot about that as well. Uh, and I, what I've boiled it down to in my mind is somebody who wants a partner in their healthcare, uh, and this is, this is true when I talk with my friends in, in various fields of medicine, that when you have, and teachers, I mean, it's not, it's really not different than, than teachers love to teach students who love to learn. Uh, you know, doctors love to work with patients who love to learn and are on a, a path of, of attempting to be the happiest, healthiest person they can be, right? Uh, and that doesn't, yeah. So I, I mean, because I do, I want to partner in health. I want to, I want to be someone's coach and guide and offer the, you know, offer up the hours and hours and hours I spent in medical school <laughs> learning, you know, minutia so that you don't have to, uh, 
but I, I believe people do do best with people that they know, like, and trust. So I want people to be able to know, like, and trust me. I want to be able to know, like, and trust them and, and partner together to achieve whatever goals the person has. And that doesn't mean that if someone says, um, you know, I always ask, are you ready? You know, this is listed here. You've listed this as an issue. Is this something that you, that is top of mind for you? Or, you know, do you want to work on this thing right now? It's okay to have, we all have health issues that are, that are sort of vaguely in our brain. And if someone asks us, we're going to list them, but we're just not ready to, to tackle it yet. And so I think honest and open communication is, is important there. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. And yes, I'm all about being the guide um, with someone as well. And it sounds to me too, like, you know, I think, I think I kind of hit on at the beginning and I definitely want to reinforce that when people come into you, it's not like a one problem situation. You can talk about Mm -hmm. your goals, your health goals, what you want to achieve. Yeah. And I think I, um, you know how if you go out to dinner with someone, there's kind of a natural breaking point, even mm-hmm. if you haven't seen them for a while, you can only talk so much, right? I mean, at some point you're like, my my bum is numb and I gotta go. Uh, so I also try to be respectful of the fact that, although I don't agree at all with the, you only can talk about one issue because a, it makes no sense. We aren't, we aren't in, you know, our issues do not come up in these discrete <laughs> black and white categories. I mean, I, I never actually could, do that one problem five minute. I was always amazed by the docs who could, who would say, nope, I just told her not to talk about that thing, but they're related. I mean, how do you have a UTI and you don't ask about sex? I mean, that they're related. I don't know. Anyway. So I was never a big one issue kind of person anyway, but, but at the same time, I don't want to say let's have a three hour conversation because there's, there's less value in, in covering too much at one time, our brains start to swim. So Some happy medium. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. Well said. Well said. Well, Dr. Aaron, I think at this point, we got to tell everybody how to find you, where, like, what can they do to contact you and get on your schedule? So what's your website and phone number and all that stuff? How do they get So the website is www.focushealthdpc, as in direct primary care, dog, whatever. I don't know that alphabet, <laughs> dot com. And uh, 253-766-5588 is our office phone number. And I would assume most of the people listening here are familiar with your office. Yes. 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 A lot of folks are going to be familiar with my office. If they are not, then, Hey guys, it's a uh, Q vitality studio in Tacoma in the Westgate neighborhood. So you will find her easily right there. And if you want more info, you can also head over to drjkrausnd.com and I will have a link to her office as well. And then we have our show notes from the podcast where we'll have all of that too. So head over to my show notes at drjkrausnd.com forward slash the health fix podcast. All right. Well, Dr. Aaron, thank you so much for coming on. I sincerely appreciate it and for giving everybody such a great idea of what direct patient care looks like. And I think this is going to be a good thing for my office, but also for folks who are listeners so they can get a little sense of how can I find other folks just like you. So thank you once again. Thank you so much. Hey, Health Junkie, do you want to take the conversation to the next level based off of the Health Fix podcast? Well, you're in luck. Head over to the Facebook group for this podcast called Find Your Health Fix. There you'll find me answering questions, but also dropping in all kinds of tidbits and keeping the conversation 